Yeah. So let us continue with the renormalization of the electroweak standard model. Um, the last time we discussed a few preliminary remarks and we went through the renormalization of QED, quantum electrodynamics, in detail, setting up all the necessary steps and building blocks in order to have a consistent renormalization picture and renormalization procedure, including in particular uh, the counter terms and uh, the definition of the renormalization scheme, which gives us, um, let's say, um, prescriptions for how to compute and how to evaluate the renormalization constants and the counter terms. And now we will do the same thing for the standard model. It is the same structure and the same order of uh, steps that we need to take, but each step is a little bit more involved. And so we will uh, start with a renormalization transformation which then produces a bare Lagrangian and a counterterm Lagrangian from which we can read off counterterm Feynman rules. The counterterm Feynman rules then enter into Green's functions and we can evaluate how they enter and then we set up a renormalization scheme where we require on-shell conditions for the particular Green functions we choose and then we can evaluate the renormalization constants and then we also have a basis for doing higher order calculations in the electroweak standard model. And probably today we will not uh, do all those steps but um, a variety of them as we will see. So let us begin. Can you see that? So we start with uh, the Lagrangian L uh, um, classical expressed in terms of physical fields and parameters. which are in particular uh, the parameters, the um, gauge coupling for QED, E, then um, the masses, MW, Z, and Higgs for the bosonic electroweak sector and electroweak symmetry breaking, the TET pole parameter corresponding to the vacuum and vacuum expectation value, and in the fermion sector, we have all the fermion masses. And uh, as we said, we have only one generation. Therefore, there is no CKM matrix and there is no mixing between the fermions. And uh, among the fields, we have, of course, the photon, the Z, W plus minus fields. We have the Higgs fields and the Goldstone boson fields which are unphysical and uh, we have of course the fermion fields F as I will call them for fermion quarks and lepton fields left and right handed and we have unphysical ghost fields. We will actually not really discuss the ghost fields in detail here um, so because we will mainly skip the unphysical sector. So, let us uh, start maybe with a bosonic sector, which is the sector involving the gauge bosons and the Higgs bosons and the associated parameters. So there we construct bare fields and parameters. In the following way, so we define a bare uh, gauge coupling E bare as E plus delta E or equivalently Z E times E and then uh, the Z E is given by one plus delta Z E. Ah, this is again this chalk which cannot be deleted. Mm, oh well. Okay, then for the masses we have M square W Z Higgs bare is given as m square w z Higgs plus delta m square 
W Z Higgs and the tadpole T bear is equal to T plus delta T. We are in calculations. We uh, set the renormalized tadpole to zero, which means that our three level vacuum expectation value is chosen correctly such that we expand around the three level minimum. And at higher orders, we will do something appropriate with a renormalization constant delta t. And that is something that we have to choose later on as part of our renormalization conditions. So this is the transformation for the parameters entering the bosonic sector. And then we have also the fields in the bosonic sector. Namely, there is the photon and z. There is given by this square root of z matrix times a z. And so sorry about this. I do not introduce some particular symbol for this z. It is just z. And so of course, don't get confused between the different appearances of z. But it becomes clearer if, if we write the matrix elements. So this is a matrix which is uh, 1 plus, or let's say, yeah, unit matrix, plus a matrix 1 half delta z a a delta z um, a z delta z z a and delta z z z. And with those indices, it becomes unambiguous uh, what we are talking about times a z. Okay. So these are the renormalized fields for the photon and z boson. This is the renormalization uh, constant matrix. And it is a matrix in the two by two space between the photon and z. And it is an off diagonal matrix. We discussed last time how it is connected to the symmetric phase of the standard model expressed in terms of the original U1 and SU2 gauge fields. But here we just use this general two by two renormalization transformation matrix. And those, between those four uh, set factor entries, there would be some relationship. So the divergencies of the four are not all independent. That is what we discussed the last time. But anyway, uh, we keep them as independent. And in particular, we can choose the finite parts later on uh, with four independent conditions. Then we have the w plus minus there is given by square root of zw times w plus minus Higgs field there is given by square root of zh times h. And the Goldstone bosons 0 and plus minus are given by z factor of Goldstone 0 and plus minus times themselves. OK, so this is the transformation. And that would be applied onto the classical Lagrangian to obtain a bare Lagrangian. And that will be evaluated later on. Let us next specify the transformation in the fermionic sector. There is less. So the quantities are, as we already said, the masses and the fermion fields. And in contrast to QED, the fermion fields um, left and right handed behave independently because we have parity violation in the weak interactions. And the fundamental gauge interactions act differently on the left handed and the right handed fermions. And from Lorentz structure, left handed fermions are independent Lorentz objects. Right handed fermions are independent Lorentz objects. And therefore, uh, they do not renormalize in the same way, but they renormalize independently. And uh, in QED, however, because of parity uh, conservation, left and right handed fermions do not have to distinguish. So that is a new feature here. So therefore, uh, first of all, the mass MF bear is given as MF plus delta MF. And for the fields, the fermion field bear is decomposed into left and right handed. And they transform independently. And so that can be written as square root of ZFL times a left handed projector 
plus square root of ZFR times a right-handed projector acting on the renormalized fermion field F. And then okay, one can for all these square root of Z, one would expand them as one plus one half delta Z. So that's all about the fermionic sector. And then we have finally the ghost sector. And here I will be a little bit uh, scarce in information, but let's just say there is, we use our psi gauge fixing. And then we have gauge fixing parameters psi and zeta. And uh, for each vector boson, there is one psi and one zeta gauge fixing parameter, and they all transform with appropriate sect factor. So psi v is given by z psi v times psi v bear on the left hand side. The same with zeta. Zeta v bear is given by z zeta v times zeta v. And uh, then for the ghost fields, we have ghosts corresponding to each gauge boson, C A C Z um, bear is given by a similar square root of Z matrix like the photon and Z fields. Z tilde, I will call it C A C Z. And for C plus minus, they are analogously Z tilde W C plus minus. And in the end, we will again uh, be able to say that the gauge fixing does not renormalize, similar to QED, and for the exact same reason, because the gauge fixing is linear, or the gauge fixing function is linear in the quantum fields. Therefore, it is not there; it doesn't receive quantum corrections, and so it is not renormalized. But that implies that the ghost sector is renormalized in a particular way. So there will be again relationships between those renormalization constants for the gauge fixing parameters which derive from the non-renormalization of the gauge fixing term. But we will not explore this sector here in this lecture, at least probably not, because um, the renormalization of the ghost sector is only necessary if you want to compute unphysical green functions at the one loop level or if you want to compute physical green functions at the two loop level. And potentially, that is not something that we will do in this lecture um, this semester. All right, but in this way, we have summarized the full renormalization transformation for the electroweak standard model. And the next step would be to work it out. In other words, this must be applied onto the Lagrangian. Then we obtain first the bare Lagrangian, including uh, involving bare quantities. Then we can expand them according to uh, renormalized quantities and renormalization constants. We will do the expansion to first order in the renormalization constants and obtain a one loop counter term Lagrangian, which gives counter term Feynman rules. And so let us do that. Okay, let's first write this down. We do this transformation. L classical becomes L bear by applying the replacement, which is then uh, re-expanded as the original L classical plus L counter term. And this can be done to a first order in the deltas, which is sufficient for one loop level. For two loop level, it wouldn't be sufficient. But for one loop level, that is sufficient. And uh, so in principle, there will be a lot of counter term Feynman rules coming from that replacement. 
and it is not really possible to derive all of them in one hour. That just takes time and it is repetitive. Uh, let's highlight a few counterterm structures. So there will be counterterms for the vector boson self-energies. There will be counterterms for the Higgs or scalar self-energies. There will be a, an interesting counterterm for the TET pole for a one-point function involving the Higgs. There will be counterterms for the interactions between gauge bosons and fermions, counterterms for the interactions of Higgs boson with fermions, and counterterms for triple Higgs interactions, and many more. But at least these six different types of counterterms, they are all interesting for us, and all of them are interesting for the physics interpretation and also for understanding how in general this calculation works. And so I would like to at least derive parts of all of those six here. And then I think that is enough so that you really know how you could go on for everything else. And so in the end, today I want to at least write down fully the counterterm Feynman rules for such counterterms. In particular, just uh, as a fun uh, preliminary remark, so as one example, there would be something which you might not expect, for example, photon neutrino. Photon neutrino neutrino counterterm. So the photon will couple to the neutrinos via such a one loop counterterm. How does that come about? That is one of the many things that we will derive. So just as an outlook, so that you see that there are some uh, maybe not totally obvious things going on. It's not half obvious, but therefore let's do it. And um, yeah, let's see how far we get. So let us begin with a bilinear part of the vector boson self-energy. And so here the Lagrangian contains the following terms. And so we simply say the classical Lagrangian uh, contains the following terms. It contains minus 1 over 2 field strength tensor for W plus minus. W plus mu nu, W minus mu nu, minus 1 over 4. Uh, then B mu nu W3 mu nu times B mu nu W3 mu nu. So here I already went half way to the physical basis, okay, and uh, but not uh, quite, so you still see the original gauge structure where we would have a field strength tensor for the U1 gauge field, B mu nu times B mu nu, and we have a field strength tensors for W1, 2, 3. W3 is here, and W1 and 2 are already combined to W plus minus. And so that could be equivalently written as the same thing, minus 1 over 4 times field strength tensors for the photon, A mu nu, Z mu nu and A mu nu Z mu nu. I write it already as a matrix notation, but this just means A mu nu times A mu plus Z mu nu times Z mu nu. And here we only need the bilinear terms. Um, so the non-abelian parts of the field strength tensors are completely dropped because we are interested in the bilinear part of the Lagrangian giving rise to such counter terms here. At this point, we apply our renormalization transformation. And what does our renormalization transformation do to this Lagrangian? We would replace the W plus W minus by its bare version, which is square root of ZW times itself. So here we get a factor ZW in the front. And uh, we already write that as 1 plus delta ZW over 2 times W plus mu nu, W minus mu nu. Okay, and then this is how the renormalization transformation works for that sector. Minus 1 over 4. And what happens here? Photon Z 
times photon Z, and the photon and Z transform with a square root of Z matrix. That is why I wrote it already like this. And so here, that photon Z vector basically transforms exactly in the way like we see it in the first line, namely with this square root of Z matrix, which is written as you see on the right. And that thing transforms, obviously, with a transpose matrix. So therefore, in the end, between the two vectors, we obtain the sum of uh, square root Z and uh, square root of Z transpose. So let's write it, A mu nu, Z mu nu. And in between, we have now the following matrix, unit matrix plus um, one half. And then this delta Z uh, AA, delta Z AZ, delta Z ZA, delta Z ZZ, plus the same thing transpose, plus one half, uh, plus um, transpose. times a mu nu, z mu nu. So then we have it. So here, this is now the renormalized form of uh, this bilinear part con uh, containing the field strength tensors of the gauge fields. And from this, you can derive counter-term Feynman rules. But this is the full Lagrangian. So for example, the photon, uh, photon times photon would be renormalized simply like one plus delta Z AA. The Z times Z term is renormalized with one plus delta Z Z Z diagonally. But there are mixing terms A times Z, which go with one plus delta Z Z A plus delta Z A Z. So there is a mixing going on. Then there are also the mass terms. So the classical Lagrangian also contains mass terms like these ones, namely plus mw square times w plus w minus plus one half m, uh, let's write it again like this, a z, then zero, zero, zero mz square times AZ. These are the mass terms in the classical Lagrangian. What happens to those? So the mass term becomes uh, MW square plus delta MW square times 1 plus delta ZW times W plus W minus. Okay, so the mass becomes the bare mass and the W field becomes the bare W field and therefore we have here a product of such renormalization transformations. And uh, they, this product can then be expanded up to first order in the deltas. Then for the photon and Z field it becomes messy plus one half. So and now we have here photon Z uh, as times, let me simply say, square root of this set matrix transpose times this matrix 0, 0, 0, mz square plus delta mz square times square root of the set matrix times az. And then we have here a product of three um, renormalization constants, which, and this product needs to be expanded up to first order. So maybe let's do that separately. What happens if we expand this product up to first order? So we obtain uh, at uh, zeroth order, we simply have the set factors are the unit matrix. Then we get uh, just the original mass matrix. This uh, sorry, mz square plus delta mz square. And then we have here one term plus um, one half delta Z transpose times the original mass matrix plus one half original mass matrix 
square times delta z. And this delta z stands for this matrix in the two by two matrix with the elements delta z, a, a, and so on. So, okay, and uh, these terms in combination are exactly sufficient to read off such a counter term Feynman rule. So I would like to write down uh, later on on one blackboard all the counter term Feynman rules in a readable form. Therefore, I would now not uh, do the work of reading it off, but let us just practice. Can you read off such a counter term Feynman rule from the Lagrangian as it is written here? So let's practice briefly. So the counter term Feynman rule for this is the prefactor of the bilinear term of the Lagrangian where derivatives become minus i times the incoming momentum. So for, for example, for the WW term, we have here something that is the field strength tensor. Uh, we have seen that before, so that gives the transverse projection operator, so that gives in momentum space g mu nu p square minus p mu p nu, transverse object. And then the counter term Feynman rule would be that object times delta ZW. And from here we get uh, on the one hand delta MW square plus MW times delta Z. And that uh, is multiplied with G mu, the metric tensor. And then our counter term Feynman rule would be this term plus the other term. And uh, that is the thing that I will write down later on onto the blackboard. And that can be read off here from this Lagrangian. And for the photon and Z, uh, it's m way more complicated, but you can also see how it works. So for example, for the photon and Z, uh, we get a matrix-like uh, structure here. So um, for example, in the kinetic term, we again get here P, P squared G mu minus P mu P nu from uh, these field strength tensors, and then this would be multiplied with the appropriate matrix element delta Z A A or delta Z A Z, delta Z Z Z, depending on which combination of fields we, we look at. So here we will have A A or A Z or Z Z, and each of these combinations will be multiplied with the appropriate combination of elements of this matrix. And then each of them will also be multiplied with something from the mass. So the ZZ part will get this mass counter term, delta MZ squared. And uh, the photon will get zero here. And then uh, there are off diagonal elements coming from this product of delta Z transpose times this matrix. However, this gives only something in the uh, second column of um, the counter term mass matrix and this gives only something in the second row of the mass matrix and so uh, in the zero, uh, one, one entry of the mass matrix there will be no mass counter term but in all the other entries there will be mass counter terms. So this is the thing we will write down later on but I will not do any more intermediate derivations unless you want me to. Do you want more details on this as a, yeah, no, okay. Then uh, that is done. So this is the counter term Lagrangian. So from this we would get counter term for the vectors and bilinear form. Next, bilinear terms for the fermions. Uh, here the Lagrangian contains fermion f bar times i d slash minus m f times f. It's really as simple as that. That is exactly as in QED. However, the renormalization transformation is not as in QED because the left and right handed fermions transform independently. And so that becomes the following f bar times uh, here the bar exchanges the role of left and right, so PR times square root of Z FL plus PL square root of Z FR times I D slash minus MF minus delta MF 
and then once again times p left square root of z f l plus p right square root of z f right times the fermion field. And that can now be simplified by doing the gamma algebra. So then we have f bar times the following, um, let's say i d slash times what? i d slash is multiplied as follows. So if we anti-commute gamma 5 with d slash, it gets minus gamma 5. So we can anti-commute the projection operators with the d slash. Then they reverse their meaning and they combine with those projection operators. And then we see that left just obtains square root of z left times itself. That gives just z f l without square root. And for the right-handed, the same, p right times z f right. So in the kinetic term with the d slash, simply the left-handed field and the right-handed field appear independently and they each get just renormalized with an independent z factor. Then how about the mass term? So minus um, mf, and so the mass term gets now multiplied as follows. So there is one term with p left. p left um, times square root of z f left times square root of z f right. Okay. So we get this product z f right times z f left for the left-handed and actually also for the right-handed. So the p left drops out and we simply get the mass times this minus delta mf, and here I drop the field renormalization because we work in first order. So then, from this here in this case, let's make explicit the counter term Lagrangian for the bilinear parts of the fermions. That would now be exactly uh, the delta part of this Lagrangian, and that is here f bar times i d slash times p left delta z f left plus p right delta z f right uh, times f minus f bar times delta m f plus m f times delta one half delta z f left plus delta z f right. That is the counter term Lagrangian evaluated precisely to first order in the deltas. And let me make a footnote here. We have assumed CP conservation and real renormalization constants. In principle, one could also uh, wonder whether the z factors might be complex. Then in this case here on the left where f bar renormalized, we would get the complex conjugates of the z factors. And uh, they, they would not be the same as the original z factors. And then here in these sums, there would uh, be some terms with complex conjugation. And uh, the p left, p right would not completely drop out. So that would be a complication in, that is necessary in the case of CP violation. But let us not uh, discuss that here, but let's keep it in mind because maybe some of you might um, work with CP violation later on and then this might have to be generalized. So, but that is uh, the fermion part, which is maybe the simplest. And from this, we can also immediately read off the counter term Feynman rules. So you can already work on the next part, which is the Higgs. So next we would do the Higgs. Um, and there, uh, let's renormalize the Higgs potential, which contains the tadpole term and the bilinear term. And maybe let's even immediately do also the trilinear term for the triple Higgs interaction. So you can take the Higgs potential from the last lecture and apply the renormalization transformation to it.
In the standard model, yes, exactly. So when we have the CKM matrix and allow for CP violation, that the CKM matrix is complex. And then uh, there is no reason anymore why the sec factors might be real. So they might be complex. Uh, or um, one might have to allow for complex renormalization of the Yukawa couplings. And so uh, there are different ways to parameterize the counter term and the Bayer Lagrangian. But uh, somewhere there must be complex renormalization constants. It is exactly the same um, kind of analysis that one has to do as we do at three level when we introduce the CKM matrix in the first place, where we ask ourselves how many independent <coughs> complex phases are inside of the CKM matrix. One would have to do exactly the same discussion at the level of the Bayer Lagrangian, and you only know. Uh, the Bayer Lagrangian, first of all, must be general. You have to write down all terms, including complex terms, which are compatible with gauge invariance. But once you have written down all terms, you can, uh, as in the three level case, absorb as many phases as you possibly can without loss of generality. And then uh, you can do it in different ways, but um, you can figure out what is the necessary set of complex renormalization constants. And for example, you would see that if you do uh, this uh, with complex set vectors, then nevertheless, in the case of the d slash term, in the d slash term, there would always be automatically a product of uh, set star times set. And therefore, here only the real part of the set enters, and complex uh, terms cannot enter at all. They drop out immediately. But in the mass term, that is not the case. And so, but there, there, you would then have somehow an ambiguity or different options of either absorbing the complex parameter inside of some delta M or a generalized mass counter term or inside of the field renormalization constants. And such discussions are of interest in the standard model CKM renormalization, but also, uh, or maybe even more so in physics beyond the standard model, where uh, these things happen in more um, elaborate forms. And these are probably some items which I would leave for the future. And maybe this is something that is more appropriate in the actual uh, research work, but a little bit beyond uh, the lecture which we do in this semester. Oh, but at least we will cover here the renormalization of the standard model without CP violation and with one generation. But there are let me just say this, I mean, so that it is on the record. And so here, if you have many fermion generations, then you would have uh, Fi. I runs from 1 to 3, for example. And then these set factors would be matrices in this 3, three by 3 space of generations. And then you would also have mixing between the generations. And uh, the muon or up quark could mix with the top quark and so on via these set, set factors. And then you have lots of ambiguities of how to define the set factors. And uh, that is a quite, let's say, yeah, involved issue. And so we don't. At least I do not plan to do it. But you already see this matrix valued renormalization between the photon and Z. And for the fermions, it would probably be still a little bit more <coughs> complicated than for photon and Z, but similar. Let us continue. So the scalar Lagrangian contains the following, plus tadpole times h, 
plus head pole divided by V times one half Goldstone zero square plus charged Goldstone absolute value square minus MH square over two H square minus lambda V H cube plus and so on plus other terms. But these terms are definitely there. We have derived them. And uh, so now let us apply the renormalization transformation. So that becomes tadpole t plus delta t times 1 plus 1 half delta zh times the Higgs field. Okay. So two renormalizations. And that will be expanded up to first order in the deltas. Then uh, next t plus delta t divided by v plus delta v times here z g0 times 1 half g0 square plus z g plus minus times g plus square minus mh square plus delta mh square over 2 times Z H times H square and minus lambda plus delta lambda times V plus delta V times Z H to the power 3 over 2 times H cube. So, and so on. So, actually, here I used some abbreviations, namely the V, which appears here, shouldn't actually appear because we uh, forced ourselves to write the entire Lagrangian in terms of only physical parameters. So what does it mean if I write V? Uh, v only appears in the sense of an abbreviation of some combination of the more physical parameters. So V is an abbreviation for two times the W mass times the weak mixing angle SW divided by the electron charge. And uh, the SW itself is also an abbreviation for one minus MW square over MZ square. Because only MW and MZ and E are fundamental parameters. Everything else is just an abbreviation for those more complicated formulas. And similarly, lambda is an abbreviation for m x square times v plus tet pole divided by 2 v cube. And here you would then have to plug in v, which is that. And then lambda becomes an incredibly messy expression. But that is what it is. And so we have to view those parameters here as abbreviations for those combinations. And for those combinations, we have defined how they transform under the renormalization transformation. Therefore, we know exactly what uh, uh, delta lambda is. Delta lambda is the variation of this expression given the transformation of the Higgs mass and the TED pole and so on. So let us evaluate this for the case where the original TED pole is actually zero. So at three level, we uh, have found the correct minimum of the Higgs potential. And then we evaluate the counterterm Lagrangian around that. So we set the original t to 0, but we do not set delta t to 0. But if we do that and expand to first order, then we get a simplification. So here, delta t is first order, t is 0, and then everything else here doesn't matter. So we get here simply delta t times h. And here also delta t divided by the tree level v is all that we need. And the set factors also do not contribute at one loop level. So we simply get that. And uh, that is then our mass counter term for the Goldstone bosons. And uh, for the Higgs mass, it behaves essentially in the normal way. So we get uh, delta mh square plus mh square times delta zh divided by 2 times the Higgs field square. And here we would get um, minus, OK, let's uh, keep the abbreviations 
um, V times delta lambda plus uh, lambda times delta V plus V times lambda times 3 over 2 delta ZH times H cube. This is our counterterm Lagrangian for the Higgs uh, potential sector. And I do not write down what delta lambda is, but delta lambda is unambiguously defined by saying uh, this line before. So uh, it is clear, right, um, what you would need to do in order to evaluate delta lambda. Maybe let's do here an intermediate uh, um, important um, remark. So we see this here, um, other quantities must be regarded as abbreviations so let's say most importantly let us write down some important abbreviations so let me maybe copy that from the left so the most important quantity for sure is the weak mixing angle SW SW, let's say SW square, is defined as 1 minus MZ, MW square over MZ square, and that is also the same as 1 minus CW square. So these quantities are super important quantities, but they only appear in the on-shell formalism as abbreviations for this fundamental expression. Similarly, let me also write down again the vacuum expectation value. V is given by 2MW times SW divided by E. And uh, maybe also as a third interesting thing, the gauge coupling GW would be an abbreviation for E divided by SW. And so then, of course, it is allowed to write your Lagrangian in terms of those expressions, but they should be viewed as abbreviations for this. And now what happens if you do a renormalization transformation? So for example, delta SW square. What is now the renormalization transformation of SW? It is, of course, the delta variation of this object. So it is delta minus delta of this fraction mw square over mz square, and that is evaluated in the sense of infinitesimals or derivatives. So that is basically um, minus delta mw square divided by mz square plus uh, mw square delta mz square divided by mz to the fourth, and that can actually be nicely written as minus mw square over mz square times then the following delta mw square divided by mw square minus delta mz square divided by mz square. So it's like here this prefactor times the relative variations of the W and the Z boson mass plus delta square terms. So this is a one loop expression. So but then delta SW square might also be an interesting building block which can appear in the counter term Lagrangian but whenever it appears it is really meant as an abbreviation of that longer expression. But it's a clearly a useful thing because it will often appear for example, then if you happen to have uh, the weak gauge coupling GW entering somewhere, then it might be simply useful to write down the variation of this, which would be delta E divided by SW minus E divided by SW times delta SW divided by SW, and then delta SW is that. And then you know 
how the uh, gauge coupling GW transforms under our renormalization transformation that we have defined. And so that are all useful building blocks that you can um, make use of in practical calculations. And last, let's also record delta V. So delta V is this uh, the differential of this fraction. And that is simply, let's say, V itself, which is that. And then you do the relative variations of all the quantities. So delta MW over MW plus delta SW divided by SW minus delta E divided by E. That would be uh, a relationship for delta V. And that, again, is something that can come in useful for abbreviating counterterm Feynman rules, for example, uh, as you see here. And you could go on and do the same for lambda and for other quantities of interest. But mainly it is important to understand uh, that there are fundamental quantities, namely exactly, the, for example, in the bosonic sector, these five quantities that we have defined. And we have five fundamental renormalization constants, and everything else can be computed out of those five. And that is what is exemplified here. Let us um, Let us go on. Actually, um, maybe let me ask you, I mean, how much more do you see, want to see of that kind? Uh, yeah, question? I have a question. So till now, um, when we normalized, I have seen these deltas as, as they are the counter terms. Um, they are infinite, for example. And how can I now imagine, now see this, so for me, now it seems like there will be, for these abbreviations, like a total derivative. Hmm. So I can, and how do I imagine, as why are these... It numbers? is of one loop order. So the uh, ordering principle is three level, one loop, two loop. And uh, that is a perturbative um, ordering principle. And so we use formal perturbation theory in the sense that we assign strictly an order to each expression, strictly an order in, in uh, perturbation theory or in terms of loop numbers. And so uh, all the delta quantities for us are now of one loop order. And so they are infinitesimal by definition compared to the three level quantities like MW over MZ. In the sense of one over epsilon, they would diverge. But in the sense of this uh, loop counting, they are infinitesimal. They are strictly of one loop order. And that is the ordering principle that we apply here. And uh, that is this renormalized perturbation theory where you sort according to the number of loops. And then you have three level Feynman diagrams where all the couplings, all the ingredients of the diagrams are of three level order. You have one loop Feynman diagrams and you have one loop renormalization constants and they combined uh, give you a uh, full one loop correction. The one over epsilons cancel and then after that cancellation indeed the total one loop correction is indeed numerically small. Doesn't depend on epsilon anymore and is numerically small but uh, before the cancellation of one over epsilon we order strictly according to the number of loops. And that would also apply to higher orders when we would take into account delta square terms. I mean, here everywhere there would be delta square terms appearing from such a variation here. And uh, those would then be of two loop order or of even higher order. And they would uh, be combined with actual two loop calculations of two loop Feynman diagrams. And then again, the same thing will happen. So, you know, I told you, for example, that there will be now a counterterm photon neutrino. Where does that come from? We could also go through the calculation of this, but actually I have the feeling that we should maybe just write down the counterterm Feynman rules and then we discuss them a little bit. And the derivation in all cases is analogous to this one. Okay, uh, is that sufficient? Maybe let's see how it looks like and if you need some more uh, explanations, then we can add them afterwards. 
So let me clean and then let's really write down systematically the counterterm Feynman rules. So let's write down this counterterm Feynman rule between two vector bosons V and V prime with Lorentz index mu nu and momentum Q flowing through the Feynman rule. And I still kept uh, the Lagrangian here. So I told you that we get from the kinetic term minus I times this transverse building block G mu nu Q square minus q mu q nu uh, and that comes with what field renormalization constant so um, where is it here so that uh, combination here produces exactly this operator and that in the counter term Lagrangian is multiplied with delta z w so for w w we get here delta z w for photon photon we get uh, one half delta Z AA plus again one half delta Z AA, so we get delta Z AA. For ZZ, we get delta ZZZ. So in principle, we always, for the diagonal ones, we get the appropriate diagonal field renormalization constants. What happens for a photon Z? For a photon Z, we get here the combination of off diagonal terms, one half delta ZZA plus one half delta ZAZ. And uh, therefore, in general, we can say delta z v v prime plus delta z v prime v divided by two, and that is always correct. And of course, for the w case, you should interpret uh, w w equal to delta z w. Then from the mass, we get the following plus i over two times mv square times delta z v v prime plus mv prime square delta z v prime v times g mu nu plus i delta mv square Kronecker delta v v prime. Okay, let's start explaining the last term with the Kronecker delta. So if we have um, diagonal uh, self-energy, WW, for example, WW, then we simply get from the top line the mass counter term delta MW square plus delta ZW times the original MW. And so then for WW, this just produces MW square times uh, delta ZW. Okay. For the diagonal Z, for the diagonal z, we would get from here delta mz square times, uh, okay, times one, and from here we would get mz square times delta z z z. That here produces mz square times delta z z z. The diagonal z factors. What do we get for the diagonal photon self energy? Photon photon. What is the mass counter term coming into play for photon photon? So from here we get zero. So for photon, photon, we get zero. There is no delta M photon. That is zero. But from the mixing terms, for the photon, photon, we have to look at uh, this matrix entry coming out of that matrix product. That matrix product in the left upper corner produces a zero, and this matrix product also produces a zero in the left upper corner. So therefore, for the photon, we get zero. And indeed, if you plug in uh, AA for the two indices, you have here photon mass, which is zero, photon mass, which is zero. So for the photon diagonal counter term, we get absolutely no mass counter term. The photon receives no mass counter term. But the mixing photon Z, that receives something, and it comes not from the explicit delta MZ, 
but it comes from the product here of the matrices. And from this product, uh, or let's start with this. So from this product, you get in the off diagonal entry something uh, mz squared times delta z, z a, which is not uh, zero in the off diagonal. And here you get delta z a z times mz squared. So therefore, here you get mz squared times delta z uh, z a, and here you get mz squared times delta z z a, uh, which is actually the same. Okay, so it works in all cases. So let me maybe highlight this in particular, a z, which is the least uh, obvious one, would give you minus i g mu nu q square minus q mu q nu times delta z z a plus delta z a z. The two are different and from here plus i over 2 mz square delta z z a times g mu nu. So from the matrix, maybe I said it incorrectly, but because of the transpose, both matrix products only give rise to the same entry delta z z a, but not to the other one. So here you see that they appear in an unsymmetric form. So this matrix element delta z z a, that always has the following role. You see in the renormalization transformation, this appears in a place where the bare um, z field gets a contribution from the photon. So here you get a term in the Lagrangian which involves the photon field, but the photon field appears in a place where actually the z boson should appear. And that is why here the photon gets multiplied with the z boson mass square. That is the interpretation delta z z a makes the photon behave like the z. And the other one, delta z a z, does the opposite. The fermion counterterm ff is uh, simpler. i times p slash delta z f l uh, times p l plus delta z f r times p r minus i times delta m f minus m f delta z f l plus delta z f r divided by 2. This is directly to be read off from our Lagrangian. Then the scalar self-energy SS, there are only diagonal scalar self-energy counterterms. There is no mixing. For example, neutral Higgs, neutral Goldstone, that mixing doesn't appear. And um, for the diagonal parts, we get the following I times P square delta ZS from the kinetic terms, which we have not even written down because it's too obvious. And then for the mass, we get minus I times the following. In the case of the actual physical Higgs, we have delta M Higgs square plus M Higgs square times delta Z Higgs. And for the goldstones, we do not have zero, even though the goldstones are would be massless, would be goldstone bosons but we do not get a zero counter term, but instead we get minus delta tet pole divided by the vacuum expectation value. And so that is what we have seen just in the discussion of the Higgs potential. Then there is the tet pole counter term for the Higgs, physical Higgs ending in a one point function. That counter term is I times delta T. And so here there is a relationship between the goldstone mass and the tet pole, and so they have the same renormalization constant. 
and the claim would be that if uh, that divergence of the TED pole is cancelled by delta t, then automatically also the Goldstone divergence in the mass is cancelled as well with the same renormalization constant. So there is an interrelation between the divergences. Then let me uh, add also the triple Higgs counterterm. The triple Higgs counterterm, Higgs, 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 that comes from uh, this term in the Higgs potential, which we have not fully worked out. But you remember that there was this term lambda times V times H cube. That is what we wrote down. And I told you that lambda and V need to be replaced by those longer expressions and they need to be renormalized. And let me now write down the result that comes out of that little calculation. Minus I times MH square times E divided by 4 MW times SW. That prefactor is what you obtain if you plug in lambda times V. And then there appears now a symmetry factor times 6. This is the usual 3 factorial coming from the permutations of the 3 Higgses. So I write that explicitly and that would of course cancel 3 over 2. But let's keep that explicit form. And then you get the combination of renormalization constants from doing uh, what I told you. And I write down the result. mh square delta mh square over mh square plus delta E over E minus delta MW over MW. And so far this is very understandable because it directly corresponds to the renormalization of that fraction. Each term gets renormalized in this infinitesimal way. Then it goes on minus delta SW divided by SW. That is also understandable. Then there comes plus 3 over 2 times delta ZH. That is hopefully also understandable because we had the factor square root of ZH to the power 3 and the variation is 3 over 2 delta ZH. And then there comes the contribution from the TED pole which you need to work out. That is delta T times E divided by 2 MH square MW SW. And uh, so you saw from the lambda and V formulas there was a TED pole appearing. And if you take into account that TED pole, renormalize it, then that uh, enters the contribution in exactly this way. So it's a kind of quite lengthy uh, form for this counter term final rule, but that's what it is. And so you could now introduce abbreviations like delta lambda, delta V, as I have said before, but here I chose now to really write it absolutely explicitly in terms of our fundamental parameters and renormalization constants. Now, let us come to the interactions. Do you first have any questions to this? This is what we can basically read off from our Lagrangian. And you should be able to do the calculation with all uh, details. Um, we have sketched how it works, but we have not really evaluated all details. But let us now come to the interactions. So for example, photon and fermion, fermion interaction. What is the counter term for that? And uh, so in one way it is obvious because you take the uh, original uh, Lagrangian term minus I E Q F and then you renormalize it in the obvious way. Clearly you get delta E over E and clearly you get uh, something from the photon field renormalization delta ZAA and that is also what we have obtained in QED. But then uh, we obtain the field renormalization for the fermions and that is now distinguishing between left and right. So we get um, plus delta Z FL times P left plus delta Z FR times P right. Because the left and right handed fermions fields uh, renormalize independently. That is the renormalization of uh, the photon cell uh, interaction. And now it goes on 
because the photon and Z mix. There is now a term where basically you get something times the mixing delta Z, ZA. And again I say uh, you get from the Bayer Lagrangian the Z boson appears in Bayer form and the Bayer Z is replaced by delta Z, ZA times the photon field. And so the photon, uh, renormalized photon, gets a contribution in the counter term coming from the Z boson interaction. So this renormalization constant gets multiplied with the three level Z boson vertex. Let me write down the value of the three level Z boson vertex. This is minus I E divided by two SW CW gamma mu. Oh, I forgot gamma mu, sorry about this gamma mu, please. Uh, times this uh, CFL PL plus CFR PR, where we have introduced the CL, CR constants. These are just quantum numbers like hypercharge and uh, isospin and so on, which govern the set boson interactions. But this is literally the three level set boson interaction with fermions. And that is multiplied with delta Z, Z, A, and in this way it contributes to the photon counter term. And now you see the answer, why is there a counter term photon neutrino? Because the Z boson couples to the neutrino in some way, and that is multiplied with delta Z, Z, A, and contributes to the photon. That is even divergent, and it is necessary to cancel divergencies from loop Feynman diagrams with uh, that form. And similarly, let me also write down the counterpart for the Z. Z mu interaction with uh, fermions that behaves in the opposite way. So you get the three level Z vertex times many renormalization constants plus the three level photon vertex times the opposite delta Z AZ from the same effect. So actually, let, let me start with this. So minus I EQ gamma mu times delta Z AZ. So this is exactly the same logic as here, and you get the photon three level vertex times this renormalization constant contributes to the Z interaction. So that is simple. And uh, then the rest is much more complicated. So minus I E divided by two SW CW times gamma mu. And now you get the renormalization of all of this. So we get delta E over E minus delta SW over SW minus delta CW over CW plus delta Z ZZ over two. Then plus delta Z FL times P left plus delta Z FR times P right. And all of that is multiplied with the three level coupling combination CFL P left plus CFR P right. That's it. So and this is now in hopefully readable form the structure of counter terms. And uh, uh, in this way, one could go on for a while and derive the complete list of all counter term Feynman rules. And there are many more, of course, like Higgs fermion interactions, triple gauge boson interactions, quartic interactions between the Higgs and the gauge bosons. And so there are many more terms, but uh, the logic is then becoming similar, and uh, I think, I hope you understand how one can in principle derive them all. And I already gave you the literature references where you can find the complete lists. Also, you can see that uh, the entire approach is quite algorithmic. Therefore, it is really possible to implement uh, even the renormalization transformation in a computer algebra program and uh, um, write a program that gives you the counter term Lagrangian. No. Hmm. Let me uh, 
add to this a small list of important green functions. So we would now have things like a renormalized vector boson self-energy at the one loop level, which we denote like in QED, sigma hat v v prime mu nu of q, which is then equal to minus i sigma without hat mu nu v v prime of q plus the counter term Feynman rule, which I simply write like this. Okay, and then you could copy the expression from there and put it here, and then you know how you obtain from the unrenormalized self-energy the renormalized one. And this uh, object is the one particle irreducible one loop contribution to this green function. Similarly for the fermions, uh, FF hat of P is equal to the unrenormalized self-energy plus this counter term Feynman rule and for the scalar as well. And uh, for the TED pole, we have I times T hat, which doesn't depend on momentum, which is this uh, one particle irreducible green function with one external Higgs, and that is uh, the unrenormalized. So no counter terms plus I times delta T. And finally, minus I times lambda hat, three point function for a fermion is defined like in QED as the one particle irreducible photon fermion fermion. Three point function is the unrenormalized version lambda hat f plus the counter term Feynman rule that we have written down before. And then you know that uh, the counter terms and the renormalization constants, all the delta C, delta M's and so on, they appear in a known way in these um, one loop building blocks. And later on, we will impose renormalization conditions like on-shell renormalization conditions such that some self energies vanish at specific momenta. And then those equations can be solved in a well-defined way for the renormalization constants. So let me highlight a few things. So here there is a difference to QED. There is no EQ prefactor as in QED. So the definition is a little bit different because uh, the EQ prefactor is not so helpful here because we have this mixing between the photon and the Z boson prefactors and uh, therefore we omit it here. And then there is also a kind of, of interest in the standard model to have full one particle irreducible objects, including tree level. We also didn't have them in, in QED and counter terms as well. So let me give some names. So I times gamma V V prime mu nu. So gamma instead of sigma. Uh, the difference is all of the gammas. So okay, so let's start with this. So here some of them have a minus in front, which is motivated by the explicit Feynman rules, which uh, we know also have a minus and so on. And uh, then we have specific names for the different green functions now. All 1PI objects are defined with plus I gamma in front, and uh, they involve tree level and all the necessary loop corrections. So that would be given by this tree level term coming from the Lagrangian minus I times sigma hat mu nu v v prime, and so on. I times gamma ff would be given by this tree level term plus I sigma hat ff and so on. 
I, comma, S is analogous, I hope. And also I, comma, H is given by I times T hat plus I times the tree level tet pole I times T, which we usually set to zero. And then finally, I times gamma AFF is the three point function mu, is given by the tree level photon fermion fermion vertex, which is the tree level 1pi contribution minus I times this lambda hat mu F. Okay. So these are then full building blocks, including tree level. And uh, it might be useful uh, to write down conditions for those where the tree level parts are included. Because then uh, it's maybe nicer to write down all order equations for those gammas, as opposed to imposing something directly on the one loop building blocks. I think now time is up. Um, maybe you have some questions to the procedure. Um, otherwise, I can give some comments. So the next step would be, of course, to write down the renormalization conditions. We have now, uh, we have now a setup which is developed, we could write a computer program to give us all the counter term Feynman rules and uh, do all the derivations. We can uh, discuss here for many green functions the counter term contributions. We uh, can check, we can compute green functions, check whether they can become finite and so on. But the next step in our general procedure, also following the QED example, is to set up a renormalization scheme where we really define systematically what we want from the finite parts of our renormalization constants. And there, as we discussed, we will choose the on-shell scheme, which is a very, very advantageous scheme for the electroweak standard model, like for QED. And there we will impose certain conditions on exactly these objects that I have listed here. Uh, in essence, we impose that the, fi uh, the finite parts and also the divergence parts vanish at on-shell momenta. And that will fix the finite parts of all renormalization constants. And it will have a very definite and, um, let's say, direct physical interpretation, which is essentially identical to the interpretation in QED. But there are quite a few more comments to be made uh, to the on-shell renormalization conditions compared to QED, and so we will take our time to write them down and interpret them and give some further comments, and so we will do that next time instead of rushing it uh, today. Okay, so if you have no questions, then I would stop here, and uh, thanks, and see you in the afternoon for the exercise. We set it to zero, but in general there will be this expression. Okay. And I mean, this is still general, and of course there is no problem in setting t to zero, and this is indeed what we will do. Nevertheless, uh, the definition is general, and we will keep that generality. Hmm.